The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Mark Haskelson. I'm the president of Compliance Group. Thank you so much for joining us today for another one of our free education series events. Today, we're going to be talking about walking a fine line, reputation management, and HIPAA compliance. Uh, I am very excited. Well, let me kind of go through a little bit of the housekeeping today. Um, this record, this uh, webinar will be being recorded. So if you want a copy of it, um, you can come to our website or also I'm very excited about iCare Pro is going to be uh, presenting with us today, one of our great partners. Um, there are lots of free resources we have to help you with compliance issues. So please don't be shy. Welcome to hit our site. Uh, and um, you are welcome to ask questions. If you are not familiar with GoToWebinar, on the right-hand side, uh, you should be able to post a question. Uh, it is posted privately, so don't. There's no such thing as a, as a, as a you know dumb question. Um, please feel free to post. We're not going to turn around and say your name. Uh, but both of us, this makes this a lot more interesting. Um, we will do our best depending on the question and where we are in the webinar. We may answer it in the middle of the webinar. Or we may save it up until the end. Uh, so hopefully you will find that valuable. Um, for today, um, as I said, my name is Mark Haskelson. I'm that guy on the left. Um, uh, our role here, and if you are not familiar with our organization, uh, we, are, um, we do HIPAA compliance. Uh, our role here is to simplify compliance so you can confidently focus on your business. We are very excited and very proud to say we are, are in our relationship with the eye care industry is uh, very deep. Uh, we are one of the, we're the 21st sponsor to Think About Your Eyes. Uh, we are also the endorsed partner by AOA Excel for what is compliance. Uh, and I am very proud to be in my fourth year as a visionary contributor to the AOA PAC. Uh, I think the uh, political the, the PAC is very important in helping um, eye doctors have better rights uh, and better reimbursements uh, in their respective states. So um, the flow today is I'm going to I'm going to pass it over to Zvi, who's going to start it off, and then I'll uh, finish up the end. Zvi, over to you. Okay. So uh, uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, yeah, my name is Zvi, and uh, I had content uh, here at iCare Pro, and uh, we're really uh, excited to be doing this. Uh, together with uh, Compliancy Group because there's such an interplay that's really important uh, between your online reputation and HIPAA compliance and both are really fundamental to delivering value to you, our client, and also to make sure that you're protecting yourself as a practice. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in here and there we go, responding to, uh, to reviews and, uh, this, and why it matters. Um, and you know, pretty much when I talk about reviews, um, I do mean online reviews, uh, of course, um, but we're going to really focus in on Google, and I'll, I'll get into why that is in just a couple of minutes here. Um, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about iCare Pro for those of you who are not familiar with us. Um, we are a digital marketing um, and consultation firm working exclusively in uh, iCare. Um, that's all we do. Um, it's what we're really passionate about. We really understand it deeply. Uh, we're really involved with a whole wide range of organizations within the industry. Um, it's where we are, it's where we live, it's where we breathe. Um, and we have over 1,600 optometry clients uh, after nearly 16 years in the business. So we're not uh, newbies by any means. Um, and uh, we're big believers in delivering uh, client value. That's really what it comes down to. It's why we don't use contracts. Um, well, everything we do, whether it's talking about you know, planning your next trunk show or making sure you show up prominently online, which is, you know, quite crucial uh, for your bottom line is, uh, is value driven. So that's, that's what we're all about. Um, and we want to help, you know, regardless of whether your clients or not, you know, we want to put out as much information out there as we possibly can to help practices grow. So I'll talk a little bit about why reviews are so important. Um, and this is where that interplay is with HIPAA compliance because how you manage your reviews is really important for your online reputation. Um, but you also need to keep yourself uh, protected and, and I'm sure Mark will go into that um, in more detail. But uh, basically reviews play two very different yet, you know, very, very much, um, you know, tied together um, as, you know, facets of, of function for you. And one is that um, your SEO depend, you know, results depend on Reviews to, to a certain extent, your Google algorithm takes a look at how much reviews you're getting. Um, and then from the human perspective is this is the first thing that will differentiate your practice from anyone else who's at the top. 
So if you want to really seem like the place to go, you've got to be proactively building up a nice number of reviews and show some interaction there. You know, leaving it at, you know, five reviews from 10 years ago was really not that impressive to anybody. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to generate more, how to respond to reviews, and then how to walk that fine line, as the title says, which I think Mark will take over a bit for uh, as we get there. So um, here's what, um, here's where inter the interplay between SEO and reviews, you know, come into play so much. Um, and here's some fairly recent stats, um, and they just keep trending more and more towards the online realm. So the vast majority of people, if they want to find a service provider in their area, they do so online. And when they do so online, I 100% mean Google, because Bing and Yahoo, this is maybe 4 or 5% market share, 90% of online searches in North America are on Google. So if you want to be findable, you want your practice to be findable in your local area um, to somebody who is searching for new, you know, for a, a new eye doctor, um, that you need to put your energy there. And that's where you're going to generate the new patient appointments that are so important to building your practice up. Um, and then on top of that, people read online re reviews, and we know that they read online reviews. And this is a really important thing that, you know, it's not just fluff. It's not, you know, icing on the cake. It is part of the persuasive um, feel of your brand, of your practice. That is one of the first things people will look for and see. And they'll not only see that you have reviews and what your ranking is, but they want to know how many you have and do you respond and how fresh they are. Um, and that freshness factor matters to the Google algorithm as well. So uh, the fact that 70% of consumers uh, will go to Google search first to find a, a local merchant, and actually that number is a little dated, it's increased quite a bit, uh, is, an, is an important you know, facet here. So I've been throwing this word SEO around. Um, it, it can actually be very technical, um, so I'll try to avoid a lot of that. But you know, from your perspective as a practice owner, an office manager, um, partner, Search engine optimization is what SEO stands for, and what it really means is doing all the things that Google wants to see uh, when assessing how relevant your website is for a local search key. So if someone puts in eye doctor near me, optometrist near me, pediatric eye care, diabetic eye care, whatever related to, the, to what you do, um, you know, Google's looking at where they are and who's the most relevant, who's the most trustworthy, and who's, you know, what website does all the right things to trigger that to, to Google, and it's a very sophisticated algorithm. Um, but what, you know, it, I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but you can see there's sort of a breakdown of, of ranking factors that, um, that Google uses. And what's particularly important, um, if you're familiar with your Google My Business, uh, listing. Um, that's a fundamental aspect of doing well on Google. And Google looks at those signals there um, as a significant factor of ranking your, your website, you know, um, how far up the page. And people do not go to page two. And even to the bottom of the page, the, the, you know, the, the, the bottom of page one, it gets very, very little eye traffic. Um, it's that top three in the map. It's the, maybe the first few organic results where the real money is. Um, and the other is review signals, um, and Google wants to see that, at, you know, coming in from a number of sources, they want to see that you have reviews, uh, but more and more, uh, Google shifting to emphasize Google reviews specifically. Um, just uh, skip this. Uh, so it comes down to the three pack at the top for any given search. This is what we call, this is what we call local SEO. And if you want to get there, you need to have the basics of SEO in place. This is a major part of what we do. But then even once you're at the top, you know, you'll notice, okay, put yourself in the eyes of a, of a potential new patient. You're looking for someone who does die, dry eye treatment. Okay. Um, you haven't checked out the website yet, but you, you, you've, you've plugged it in. You live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so you've plugged that in. You know, this is the three at the top that you're getting. Okay. What differentiates them? Oh, this guy's got 5.0. Okay, but it's based on three reviews. Okay, um, I care for Tulsa, 3.5. That's not so fantastic. Um, oh, Harold, I care downtown, 56 reviews at 4.9. That makes a huge difference, um, and the data is really clear that people will 
generally pick that person, you know, seven times out of 10 out of the three. So um, it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty significant uh, factor in people's, you know, consciousness. Um, and the fact that you have reviews there makes it more likely that you show up here in the first place. Okay, now the question I already gave away the answer to, but uh, in terms of which reviews matter most, this is a, a bit of a complex question and, and it gives a lot of anxiety to a lot of doctors. So, I, you know, I want to, I work with um, doctors all the time. Um, you know, my job when I'm not doing marketing content or, or optometry content is to provide value for individual practices just like yours. Um, and this is a conversation we often have. Should I be worrying about Facebook, Google, Yelp? Um, and so here's, here's a couple of things. Yelp is no longer all that relevant like it used to be. A few years ago, Yelp was really, really important. People would search only in Yelp. Um, and it used to also be that Google would aggregate the different reviews right in the, um, the information they'd show about your business. So if you searched for your practice and it showed up on the right-hand side, you know, once upon a time you'd see you know, how many Facebook reviews you have, maybe your solution reach if you have solution reach. Um, you know, you'd, you'd immediately still see the Yelp listing and pe that was very important to people. And that's, that's really changed. Uh, Google prioritizes its own reviews and they've done that ever since they yanked reviews out of Google Plus and made it part of your Google My Business listing. And Google Plus is pretty irrelevant and for the most part shut down. Um, so I wouldn't even worry about that at all. Um, basically, you want to make sure you have a few good reviews and that your average is decent on Yelp and on Facebook and that you are responding to negative reviews on every platform. However, they have, there's a lot of diminishing returns that applies to any other review um, service that's online. As for solution reach and the like, I, I, it really has no marketing value anymore. Um, but the Google reviews are where it, it really counts um, because th that continues to add to what's called signal traffic, traffic signals to Google. It shows that your Google My Business is used by people, um, that there's interaction and freshness and relevancy. And those are things that Google loves to see when assessing which website should be placed for second and third and then, you know, uh, and, and for, then further down. So that's why, I, you know, if you're going to focus on one thing, it should always, always, always be Google. Uh, and I'll put it bluntly, um, working to proactively generate more Google reviews is probably the single most important thing you as a practice in-house are doing for your marketing. So, and here's why, you know, um, if you feel that you have a great website and that's enough, it, there's nothing necessarily in place to make sure that you're findable. That's where the SEO comes in. SEO you know, depends on the hierarchy of the website, the content on your website, um, your online business listings, your reviews, your Google My Business. That's how you show up, not the website itself. But then once they've made that search, and most of the vast majority of people, again, are using Google, um, they look at your reviews. And it's only then that they choose to either call you straight from Google, in which case they don't even go to your homepage. And that happens more often than you think. Um, or they go to your website and interfa you know, want to learn more they see who you are as a brand. They go to the different pages that might interest them, uh, content-wise. Um, you know, what services do you offer? What insurances do you take? Um, and then they choose to make to book an appointment or to make a phone call. Um, but this, you know, this second piece here of the Google reviews is really significant. You know, not not to put too uh, fine a point on it. So the question then comes: How do you generate reviews? Um, and one of the things that we found ourselves at iCare Pro coming up against was a real reticence by the uh, patient communication tools, the solution reaches, the demand force. They really wanted to prioritize their own reviews, which, as I mentioned, have very little marketing value because Google doesn't really look at them. Um, they're not shown prominently. They are, at best, feedback for you um, or something people can see once they come to their website. But getting them to the website uh, takes work in the first place. So we decided to, um, we do have a, a suite of apps that are useful for our practices to update their website and manage their reviews. Um, so we do have a review app as part of that. And this is basically what it looks like. Uh, it's extremely simple. You have a, mo you enter in the patient mobile phone number and you press send, you can, and it sends them a live link to leave a, a five review, a five star review on your Google page. Um, and all you have to do is 
ask, you know, did you have a good experience with your eye exam today? You know, were your glasses fit to your satisfaction today? The verbal ask is important. You're going to get a much better response and it's better for HIPAA. Uh, I'm sure Mark will comment. Um, they, they say yes. You say on, you know, you have your staff trained. You say, you know, on the spot, I'm so glad to hear that. You had a good experience with us. If you don't mind, I'm sending you uh, a text. Please follow the link and leave us a nice review on Google. They often will do it on the spot. And I have seen practices go up from a mere handful of mediocre reviews to many, many, many five-star reviews. And that has made, you know, uh, at least anecdotal, anecdotally across dozens of practices, I can tell you that it's made an impressive difference uh, in new patient numbers generated. So responding to reviews. Um, people often ignore this or they only respond to the negative reviews. And the fact is that um, responding to reviews shows activity on your Google My Business. Again, I'm talking about Google reviews uh, from here on in. That's all I'm talking about when I talk about reviews. Um, for people who had a good experience, you're now ex taking that fantastic patient experience and extending it out of the office by responding positively to their positive review. People like the feedback to their feedback. Um, now, if you've ever seen your Google reviews, they're not listed chronologically unless you list them that way. They're actually listed um, by how, you know, by relevance and how Google assigns that is not exactly clear. Um, but, uh, I, if I'll show you this example here, t t oops, it tends to default to, um, most relevant. If you are only responding to the negative reviews, it could be that, um, that's what will show up highest because it has the most activity around it. So it's important to respond to everything on a whole wide range of levels, um, the good and the bad. Um, you'll see here that, um, this is, a, um, this is a practice that has generated a ton of reviews in a year and a half using the app. Um, and it's been a huge benefit for them. Um, I'm always sort of warning them not to get into any explicit details if you're reading the beginning of the response here. Um, it's kind of a gray zone hippo-wise. I'm sure Mark will jump into that more. I always suggest very general responses, even to people you absolutely love. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's something that um, I'll certainly want Mark to speak to um, a little bit more. But you don't want to, you know, from our perspective, we always counsel a very, very conservative approach to HIPAA because uh, we want to deliver, you know, maximum return, not uh, lawsuits, <laughs> not problems from bottom feeders. It's always better, you know, bottom, it's, you never know when you're going to a nasty letter from a lawyer who's trying to shake you down. It's always better just to avoid that. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to quickly give the rundown on how, you know, we counsel people to respond. And it's generally be general to a nice review. You know, you could be, keep it really simple. Thank you for your kind words. You know, we really, I'm glad you had a good opportunity. Some people go, you know, much greater length. Um, you can actually download this whole, I'm not going to read this whole thing because we have a whole like top 10 responses that you can download from one of our eBooks. I'll share the link to, um, at the end of the, uh, the webinar, but, uh, just keep on top of it. Um, make sure you're proactively requesting that people leave reviews and always respond to reviews. You don't have to go back and leave reviews uh, and leave responses to reviews from eight months ago, but you know, moving forward, maybe a month ago and then onwards, you should, you should be a little bit more diligent about it um, for all the reasons that I've said. The more activity you have on your Google My Business listing, the more Google sees that as, as, as positive, as, reliabil as reliability and relevance. Um, so, um, you know, here, here's a fun, you can, you know, you can go it all out if you'd like, you know, here's a funny one. The person, uh, appreciated the wonderful aroma of peppermint in the office. And they said, you know, we're glad you had such a wonderful experience with the doctor. Um, and you know, we like the peppermint too. Um, however you want to go, um, just don't get into patient specifics. Don't be, you know, it shouldn't be like, I'm so glad I could help you out with that scratched eye. Um, that's not where you want to go. Now, when it comes to bad reviews, you're, <laughs> what people often forget when responding to bad reviews is they think it's an argument about facts, and it's not. Um, you don't want to go there. You, no one wins an argument online. Everybody loses. Um, what you're showing is actually, you don't really care about the original poster. You want other people to see and understand and take in that you take patient concerns seriously. Um, so the best thing to do is you know, thank them for their, for their comments, ask them to reach out to you directly so that you can resolve it to their satisfaction. And if they brought up an issue, let's say the quality of your 
frames, um, the way you bill, answer it not specifically, but generally in, you know, as a practice, we strive, you know, to provide as clear billing as possible. There's <clears throat> insurance can always be complicated. Um, you know, let, let's talk about it. Um, we stand by the quality of the frames that we sell. If there's a problem, you can bring it in. Don't talk about their specific interactions at all, at all, at all. If there's one person who's going to leave, um, if, if someone goes out of the way to leave a negative review, the person's also more likely to make a stink about any kind of HIPAA violation if they know about it. So um, I do have some, you know, reviews that, uh, some responses that uh, some are funny, some are um, right to the point, but in general, um, Here's an example. You know, the person says, you know, I had a hard time with my, you know, with my contacts, um, and he felt that he was treated poorly and had his property broken. And you know, just thanks for your feedback. We strive to provide exceptional optical service. Focus on quality. We stand by our products. Um, please contact us directly or drop by our office. Your earliest convenience. We'll do our best to make it right. That's it. Don't get into any specifics. Um, and uh, one of the reasons it's so important to proactively generate reviews, you know, as I was saying, is because people don't go out of their way to leave a nice review unless they're very, very, very kind people and, and conscientious people. Most people just go about their business feeling great. So even if you have 99 out of 100 patients walking out of your practice feeling really great about the patient experience, very few of them are going to actively leave a positive review unless you're actively making a proactive attempt to ask them for it. Um, but people who have had a bad experience or feel like they had a bad experience, it's almost always an insurance issue. You know that, I know that. Um, they're going to leave a nasty review. They'll go out of their way to leave a nasty review. Um, and that can quickly tank your average. You know, if you you show up on that, you've got great SEO, you show up on the, the terms you want to show up for, you know, for a local eye doctor, uh, eye exam, any a specialized service that you offer, vision therapy, whatever it is. If they see that and then they see, you know, 3.5 stars, that's a red flag for a new patient and they are much less likely to choose you. Okay, so I'm going to hand All this. All right. Yeah. All right, Mark. Thank you. Great, great job. And I, and I, uh, yeah, I was, I was tempted to jump in there on a couple of the compliance, uh, or, uh, but, but um, I figured I would let you uh, roll through and I would do it all in one shot. Fantastic. Okay, so... Um, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about HIPAA, but specifically how it relates directly to your, um, you know, what, let's call it HIPAA compliant marketing, right? And 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 how you how you share data um, to your patients with your patients in what is today's world, which is obviously uh, far different than it was in the past. Okay, so um, one of the things I like to do is talk about, you know, if you really take a moment and step back and think of patient loyalty. There are all sorts of predictors that are well known, and if you think of some of the big brands in, in the United States, um, they really tie to five specific things. The overall satisfaction of the service you provided, that's kind of common sense. But then you start seeing, and this is where the intersection of why I think what, what, what these topics and my topics intersect is reputation. All right. And as you saw some of the statistics, people are now far, you know, it used to be that you only trusted your friends and family about referring to a medical professional. In today's world, uh, I think it's 76 or 82 percent or something of the people now trust an online review as much, if not more, than they do a personal recommendation. OK, now the rest of predictors around patient loyalty have to do with. Did you solve the problem they had? So resolution, and this this primarily has to do with staff following through what they say they do, and how your overall patients feel. And whether you're thinking of Starbucks or Nordstroms, or when you walk into Disney, there's an experience you have, and that's really what you want to do. And you want your patients to be talking about that online, sharing it with their friends, and hopefully helping you improve prove that. So now. I'm going to take this to HIPAA very specifically. So most people presume HIPAA law is very complicated and I mean, it is 700 some odd pages of miscellaneous things, but um, most people believe it has a lot to do with tech. Um, what you're seeing in front of you, and I'm going to make the connection in between brand loyalty and what's called the seven fundamental elements of an effective compliance program. Okay, and what, what this is, is this is actually the federal guidance that a, an auditor who comes to your office, this is the scorecard they pull out. 
Okay, there are a lot of other technical questions they may ask, um, but this is the way they measure. And one of the reasons they measure it this way is there's a really big difference into in between a small rural independent eye care practice and what is some of the very large organizations where you might have 10 organizations and you're, 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 you're exchanging or, or, or working with a LASIK center, et cetera. Okay, so here's how it works. It's got to be in writing, okay, policies and procedures. And I'll explain that in standards of conduct in the next slides of how important that is in regards to your patient loyalty. Someone's got to be in charge. Okay? It does not have to be somebody with some compliance degree. It has to be somebody who says, look, I am going to be looking at our practice in, in addition to my regular job. I'm going to be looking from the perspective of are we doing the things that are designed to protect our patient's information? Okay, You have to have what's called effective training and lines of communication, and that's um, just Training uh, for one organization with very low turnover in a small group could be done uh, you know, by one of the staff members. Uh, if you have a 10 location organization and you may need external organizations to be training for you um, on a regular basis, okay? Internal monitoring and auditing, same thing. Are you making sure that your information, who's accessing your patient information, um, is doing it in, 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 correctly? Right? You know, why would somebody who is just uh, there, you know, a cleaning person who came in to help straighten out your office, why are they leafing through your cabinets or into your computer? Now, enforcing standards and responding uh, promptly to detective offenses, it's kind of common sense. If someone's not doing what they're supposed to do, they might be reprimanded, they might be fired. And if you do have a breach or an incident, you do need to respond quickly. Okay, so this is what the way you are measured. Now, why is this so important? is that although the average patient does not necessarily understand everything about HIPAA law, okay, especially in eye care, I think the, because you know, half of your business, if not more, is actually retail, the selling of, um, of frames and lenses, um, that you know, your, your, your patients look far more, much more like consumers, which means they're getting more educated about the issues. So the unfortunate reality is 68% of the people are not confident that you are protecting their information. And the really sad reality is over half of the people who've had identity theft absolutely believe it was caused by their medical practitioner, i.e. you. Now, I, when I, you know, often when I speak to doctors, and I'm not sure if you guys are all going to be at the optometrist meeting in St. Louis in, uh, next week, hopefully come by. I'll be speaking again. Love to meet you. Come by our booth. But the bad news is, whether we like it or not, tens of thousands of records are breached per day. Okay, most organizations, in this case, 89% of them have had a breach or ransomware in the last two years. But the good news is the majority of the things that caused it had to do with administrative mistakes. Okay, and this is where you're going to see me start talking about how you train your people, how you educate them, how you, your policies, procedures, and training are going to be very important for protecting. Now, for those of you who are on this call or are doubting Thomas's and say, Mark, I don't have to worry about this because, uh, you know, no, no, I don't know anyone who's been audited. Um, there are currently 13 open investigations right now, specifically with eye care organizations um, for what's called a meaningful breach, which means more than five, 500 people were affected. Okay, hopefully your name is not on here, uh, but I have done presentations like this uh, where someone has said, uh, oh my lord, that is an organization, I know them, or I had one case where uh, somebody in the room said that they had actually just acquired that practice and they were not aware of it. By the way, the point I'm drawing here is not just to show you that this is happening, but to make you aware that your breaches are public record. This is what's called the OCR wall of shame, and if you were to Google it, um, and, as, and, any can, and any of your client patients can, this is public record. Okay, so anybody can go look this up and see this. Um, so hopefully, um, when we start talking about reputation management uh, and you, you know your position and social, um, they are going to find if you, if you are involved with something, and this is going to cost you patience. So because um, the bad news is most people think of very high tech, you know, uh, people in hoodies and foreign governments coming after you. Unfortunately, the majority of breaches in the United States are 39% um, of them are just simple theft or loss. Okay, and the statistics are that one in 10 people will lose a smart device in a given year, which means if you have more than 10 people on your staff, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to have a breach, which by law you must report, which means you are going to have at some point an investigation by the U.S. government into your current HIPAA procedures. Now, the next thing I often hear, and um, um, 
listen, I, I understand all of your positions on this or the misunderstanding is people say, hey, Mark, I don't have to worry about this. I have a great EHR I outsource to. I have an IT person I outsource to. Awesome. Except that 30% of the time it is actually the business associate or the vendor you hired that is actually the cause of your breach. And it was actually, it was not in eye care. Uh, it was actually in a, one of the other industries, but an EHR had a breach, had ransomware attack, and basically propagated that to all of their healthcare clients, okay? And this happens every day. I see this because this is the kind of stuff we track. The rest of it is, um, and by the way, when we say hacking incidences, people are very rarely as someone going to hack, you know, going to be, you know, after your practice. But what's called ransomware, and we have a whole other set of web webinars on ransomware, ransomwares, ransomware is a whole different creature. Um, and 88% of ransomware attacks are, are, are actually um, are targeted to small and mid-sized medical practices. And um, I've even seen some that are very clever uh, in the way they're designed is rather than have to pay the ransom, what they say is if you send this to two of your friends, uh, they will give you your data back. Okay, so, um, but for today, we're not getting deep into technology. Really, what I want to do is continue to educate you on HIPAA and how HIPAA and your, your, your online social media presence, your, your, your HIPAA compliant marketing come together. Okay, so the basics of HIPAA is actually three rules. Okay, often I hear people thinking, uh, misunderstanding that. So the privacy rule is pretty straightforward. It's how you talk to your patients. Okay, it's generally not having a loud conversation in a hallway where someone else might overhear. There's lots of other rules to that. The one where I see that most of um, my, my eye doctors are getting into trouble is the misunderstanding around the security rule. Okay, often people misunderstand and believe that a security risk assessment, okay, an SRA, which is required for meaningful use or MAC or MIPS, is makes you HIPAA compliant. It does not. Okay, if that's all you did, you are satisfying one third of one rule. Okay, you're, you're, you're satisfying less than 10% of what's required under HIPAA law. Now, the rest of HIPAA law has to do, or audits, have to do with your physical, administrative, and privacy audits. Okay, um, now you noticed earlier, tie two things together 89% or 86% of breaches were administratively caused, which means if you do this right, Okay, going back to that conversation around patient loyalty and what drives it is, the more educated your employees, okay, the clearer the policies and procedures that they are supposed to follow, the better trained they are, the better they're going to serve their patients, the better they're going to, you know, and the happier your patients will be and will drive up your patient retention and the profitability of your firm. Okay, now the third part of HIPAA has to do with called the omnibus rule. This is Probably the real reason why all of us care so much about HIPAA today is the omnibus rule went into effect only a couple of years ago, and it said two specific things. Well, it actually had three specific effects. Okay, one is they really stepped up the funding for what is audits, okay? But two, the reason they did was that around two things. They changed the law saying that any breach or incident that occurs in your practice, you must report to the U.S. government. Okay. Now, a lot of people don't report, and I warned you that that is a big mistake. If they catch you not reporting, uh, the fines are rather steep. Now, what they're really after is what's called a meaningful breach. And a meaningful breach means you had more than 500 records um, uh, um, co compromised. Okay. And in that case, they're going to want um, either way, the law says you must investigate and then report the appropriate answers, um, you know, or, or how you, what, what was the problem, how you remediated, who was affected to the US government. Now, the big thing that has to do with vendors, right? We started talking this thing about, we started saying how um, it, a lot of this has to do with the 30% of the breaches are caused by the people you hired. Okay, because of that, the US government said two things. They expect you before, notice I said before, you share information with a vendor. So for example, iCarePro um, is one of our clients and has what's called a seal of compliance, which means you can confidently share information with them because there's two parts to being HIPAA compliant, right? One is the business associate agreement. The law says you have to get a contract. Um, the agreement has to say, I think there are a lot, there's a lot of data that can be in there, but really what it says is if you, you know, that both of you understand that the law is the law, and that you are you are responsible for yourself, okay? So in other words, a lot of people think, well, you know, don't worry if I get, you know, if I have a breach, I'm gonna have, I have cyber liability insurance, or I'm gonna, you know, don't worry, my IT person's gonna take, be responsible for it. It's not the case. If you have a HIPAA breach, 
no matter what contract you have, no matter what legal stuff you have, et cetera, you, can, you, can, you are responsible for what you and your staff do. Okay. The last thing is called a technical due diligence. This is equally important. It's making sure that before you share that data, the PHI, the protected health information, that there is um, that you have confirmed that that organization truly has the technology in place to protect the information that we're talking about. Okay. So now, next thing. I talked a little bit about security and compliance, and I've mixed these two things together. Okay, but here's how it all really comes together. If you are doing just the security risk assessment, okay, what you have is you're addressing the items on the left-hand side, okay? Now that is awesome, that is important, but the problem is if you were just doing a security audit and then remediation and maybe some policies and procedures, you're neglecting to do the rest of what's required under the law, okay? Now, I'm gonna stress this again. If you are HIPAA compliant, what you've done is the benefits of this is you've 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 addressed where your risks are and you've fixed them, okay? Which means you are in a position where you are going to be more um, you 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 are ultimately improving the way your practice runs. Usually makes you more profitable. We see about fifteen percent, okay? The second thing is is because you've you you you've got policies, procedures, and you've trained your people really really well. They then serve your 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 patients better. So your patient loyalty and your retention goes up, ultimately, once again, affecting profitability. And for those of you who are interested in either retiring and selling your practice, or maybe you're interested in being involved with private equity, uh, the feedback we get from the private equity firms we, we work with is that organizations that are known to be HIPAA compliant are, are who they prefer to acquire. They're more profitable, they work smoother, et cetera. Okay, so real quick, it's six audits that are required every year. You need to identify your gaps. You then have to remediate those gaps. Some will be security related. Some will be related directly to policies, procedures, and training. So you must have not just security policies, but you have to have, to have administrators, privacy, and security policies, procedures. You need to have also HIPAA training. Those things need to be a couple things that have to happen every year, the audits, and your individual employee attestations. A lot of people get in trouble is because they're like, hey, three years ago we did an audit, or two years ago we did a, 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 a HIPAA training. This stuff needs to be done every year, and very specifically, okay, you need your, your employees to legally agree to follow the rules you set. The example I would give a social media is, and I'll give some real world examples in a minute, is if, 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 if the client didn't or the patient didn't specifically say, yes, you could do something and, the, and your staff does, you now have a HIPAA violation. Okay. Business associate management we talked about, incident management, very similar. When an incident occurs, you have to investigate it and then report what that data you identified to the U.S. government. Okay. So that's being fully HIPAA compliant. That's doing it correctly. Okay. So now... To give you some real world examples of where we see people um, and, and the impact it has to hopefully, you know, kind of make you guys really appreciate, I told you about the benefits, right? Greater profitability, happier patients, more loyal patients. But let me tell you a little bit some of the not so happy situations. Okay, so we had one organization, this is not our client, this is, this is, these are HIPAA violations that were reported, they're public record. Um, a, a physical therapist had a patient testimonial. The patient wrote a beautiful letter explaining how much they liked them. Uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the doctor's office then took that patient testimonial and put it up on their website. Okay. Now, if they had had permission in their use and disclosure documentation, there would have been no problem. But in this case, it was a $25,000 fine. Now, the specific reason cited, and you're going to hear this time and time again as I talk about um, um, HIPAA violations, was failure to have updated policies and procedures. So you might have had something, sit, they might have had something sitting on a shelf, but it clearly didn't reflect the way that they ran the business. Otherwise, the staff member would have been properly trained and on the policies and procedures of the organization and would not have posted that, right? They would have known, ah, I need to get a use and disclosure document or a sign authorized use, uh, use of, that, uh, of that PHI in a way that the patient said it was okay. Press releases. Um, press releases are awesome. Okay, in this particular case, uh, this was a hospital in Texas. They were very proud that they had caught somebody trying to um, do fraud, waste, and abuse. 
uh, the, the patient had come in, they had done, it was, um, uh, you know, false insurance documentation. Now, the mistake that the hospital made is they put out a press release bragging on the fact that they had caught this woman. And in that, in that press release, they had announced, they had uh, talked or mentioned both her procedure, okay, um, and who she was. Now, by the way, notice, I'm going to tie this together back to what V was sharing. If you have a patient who posts something on social media, they had the right to post about their refraction. You did not have the right to confirm it, okay? Unless you had a specific use and, doc, use and disclosure document that said, you know, if, if you post something on social media, you know, it's okay for me to respond to it, okay? $2.4 million fine. Okay, I love how beautiful some of the display cases um, uh, many of the ODs have built out. Um, it is very tempting to fill them and share them on your website. Fantastic. I highly recommend that. Um, the problem is, uh, in this case, this was uh, in New York City. Um, while they were filming that, they weren't paying attention to, in the background, there happened to have been some patients. Okay? And because the patients had not given express permission for this video to be shot, when it was ultimately put up and viewed, um, they filed basically a HIPAA violation, uh, a $2.2 .2 million fine. Okay, the last one has to do with business associate agreements. I'm just gonna stress this one because of how often I see this mistake made, okay? It is against the law for you to work with an organization that is any vendor that is supporting you. They are doing something for you that involves them working with your PHI, and by the way, even um, an answering service, um, an IT provider, someone like iCare Pro, um, all of these folks are in some way being exposed to what is PHI, therefore you must have a business associate agreement in place. Now, okay, um, in this case, the fine was only $31,000, but ultimately the organization and the ongoing investigation, they closed their business, okay? So, um, you know, I would hate to see any optometrist in the United States have to close their business because of $100,000 worth of liability that then... Um, uh, basically force them to close. Um, one of the things I'll stress about all of this is it is not the HIPAA police you have to be afraid of, okay? It is often the class action lawsuit behind the public disclosure of this that is the thing that is going to ruin your practice. Because um, Z kind of mentioned earlier, you know, no one wants to get that, you know, lawyers and I'm not trying to beat up on lawyers, but but you know they need to make a living, and often many that are making their living are, are are looking for the mistakes that people make, and then coming after you. Okay, so the class session lawsuits are usually millions uh, against what is lost. Actually, the, the official ratio is ten is is ten percent of a HIPAA violation is the fine. Ninety percent of the cost to the organization is downtime um, and and the financial repercussions of what they have to do with lawsuits, etc. Okay. So um, I think we are at this point. Um, we have a couple of uh, good questions that you folks have passed. Um, um, the first one, I believe, is one that, that, that is really about social media. So I'll, I'll, I'll let V take that one. While he's doing that, please, folks, use the right-hand side. Start posting questions. They can be about social media. They can be about HIPAA compliance. Don't be shy. Uh, we're here to help you. So, yeah, I wonder if you want to take that first one. Sure. Uh, so I accidentally deleted, I think, the first one that came in. Um, but uh, the question was uh, how you get to the um, to that app where you um, can send that text. And that's uh, that's something we've developed for our clients. And uh, certainly, if anyone's interested in a demonstration of how that works, I'd be happy to set that up uh, for you. But uh, that's that's an app that's made it very easy to help generate uh, the reviews. Um, now, some, uh, Lisa asks, um, since she hasn't been good about responding to reviews as the new practice director, um, that you know she'd like to uh, go back to. She needs to go back to respond to all the old ones or just the more recent ones. I would say it's not that important to go back. You know, more than a couple of months. Um, it's kind of it's kind of too much to to respond to a review, good or bad. Um, that's a year old. That seems kind of uh, to lack, you know, lacks on your part. Better just to let it go. Uh, start maybe a month ago and then move forward. Uh, is all you have to do. Uh, anything else coming in? Send them our way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me let me let me take one of the ones that came in. Uh, so um, this is more around, uh, and V, you had talked about it, is and that is. Um, it's tempting to two things, right? The question was, you know, how do you respond to 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 you know negative or positive reviews online, right? Stay anonymous. What I mean by anonymous is, 
it, if they're talking about their, their, their experience with you, they can, it's their information, but you don't want to be in a position where you are confirming or denying. So it's great to say the person talks about the experience they had in buying frames or a fraction, whatever it is, that's fantastic. What you don't want to say is we're so glad that we were able to do that refraction for you last Tuesday, you know, et cetera. What you want to say is thank you so much for the positive feedback. We really appreciate our customers. We try really hard to make sure the experience you have in our location was a wonderful one. Great answer, okay? Negative reviews, okay? You you do not, and, and we made this point, you know, <laughs> when I say to people, have you ever gotten into an, a disagreement with your significant other or your children around something? If you do it via text, it always ends poorly. Now, when you do it in public, it not only ends in poorly, it often ends in far more trouble for you, okay? So same thing with negative reviews from a HIPAA compliance perspective. What you want to say is not um, confirming or denying. What you want to say is, thank you for this feedback. I, you know, We take customer service very seriously. Please contact the office directly. Or if you'd like to private message me, for example, here's an email address you can message me directly about. Okay? And those are the kind of things that you want to do that are very positive but neutral that allow you to address this, okay? I think there's a couple more that came in that are that are more to you. Sure, I, I'm seeing questions about whether it's the uh, it's better to have the staff or an owner respond. Um, as long as you're keeping a response extremely general, just like uh, Mark is pointing out, you know, don't, you know, not, I'm so glad I could help you with, you know, uh, your cataract surgery or whatever it is, if, if you're doing surgery or the co-management or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, we strive to always, you know, provide an amazing patient experience. As long as it's general, it doesn't really matter. But it should be um, generally the way Google works is um, you're responding as the practice, um, you know, but there are different, you know, you can, you know, sign it physically with the, you know, as you write the response, you could state who it is. And often I see the doctors do that. And I think that's, that's actually just fine. Um, unless Mark, you have anything to add to that? No, no, that's perfect. Um, uh, okay. So one question is uh, some folks, by the way, just a reminder, this will be available. It is being recorded. So, um, you know, these questions, et cetera, and the big, the whole webinar are available. Uh, if you have other, I can speak in regards to HIPAA related questions. We have lots of different training and education on our site. We have a free HIPAA training. So if you go to a compliance group backslash webinars, you'll get all that stuff. Okay. But the next question was a specifically HIPAA related question. Um, an employee called an elderly patient's daughter to get a noon phone number for her. Did she violate HIPAA? Okay. Elder, elderly. So, um, you know, the, the, the legal relationship of, um, you know, children taking care of their parents and or of a child becoming an adult. Okay. So um, the best way to solve this problem is to make sure your use and disclosure document, and everyone should have one, every patient you have, you should have a use and disclosure document, should specify there's some common things, right? Are we allowed to reach out to you? Are we not allowed to reach out to your, you know, to, to your family members? You can ask that type of question. In an emer you know, if we can't get a hold of you, are there other people that are we allowed to reach out to other people in your family? Okay, doesn't mean. By the way, I, I would say, um, you know, you didn't break the law here. Okay, because in the end, one of the ways you want to think about it is from the perspective of you were just trying to serve your patient better. Okay, now if you called somebody's office. And said, "Hey, I'm from such and such, you know, uh, you know, eye care facility, and I'm finding out about, you know, confirming someone's appointment. Bear in mind, there are some organizations that wearing, you know, think of a pilot, um, you know, that wearing glasses, if not disclosed, will cause them to lose their job. Okay, so it's, I think this is somewhat of a relative thing. If you're, like I said, if you're calling, you know, add your use and disclosure documents. That's the right way to do it." Um, and then also think about what you're doing, you know, would it be construed as something that would, could, could, could be damaging to the person you're talking about? I don't think, uh, I don't think, uh, grandma would be offended that you were calling to make sure that he or, you know, that grandma could pick up her, uh, her new frames. Um, let's see, what's the next one? I think obtaining permission to respond uh, to online reviews. Um, you don't, well, um, the, you may have specific, more, more specific to, to the world of, of reviews. Generally, use, my answer is going to be the same. Use and disclosure. Did you ask them when they became a patient, is it okay for you to communicate with them through, you know, online is the best way to address that. So, yeah, I don't know if you had any more to add to that. Well, I, I would answer in general, if someone leaves a review, 
uh, on, let's say, in Google My Business. It's public, uh, and that was their choice to talk about their experience as a patient. Um, I don't believe, you know, do correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I've never counseled people need permission to respond to the review, but the response itself needs to be very generic and not about the individual. Absolutely correct. You're, you're dead on. Okay. Because part of the way, one of the things, and the, one of the ways to think about this, which may make it more, I guess, clear, I can do whatever I want with my PHI. Okay. My personal health information is mine. If I choose, if I turn around and post, you know, hang my, medical records on the side of my building, okay, or I give you permission to do so, then I have actually done it. What you don't want to do is disclose something that the patient did not give you permission to do so. So there is kind of an implied in the, in the case of reviews that they've posted something, so you have the right to respond back. Just do not be confirming or denying what services were provided. Keep it to thank you for your feedback, for what you said. That was very kind, okay? Um, uh, the next one is what is a good way to ask patients for the reviews? Okay, so this is, uh, you know, I, I touched on this uh, a bit, and it's something that as a company we struggled with in, in order to deliver that to the, to, you know, to our clients, the practices that, that were working with us. Um, there's no straightforward way other than asking all the time, and even then, uh, you've got to make it really, really easy or people won't. So you've got to say, did you know? Did you have a good experience? You know, we're so glad to hear that. If you don't mind, please leave us a nice review on Google of your own volition. Um, now people forget even when they say yes, or they get lazy, or, or whatever, and they also don't know how to find how to directly leave a Google review, which is why we developed uh, this app where you, on the spot, can send them a text with a live link to leave that review. Um, and the benefit there is it's going to their phone that if they have a Google account of any you know kind, they're already logged in, it's one step. They click the link and they leave the review. Um, and that's the only way that we found to be effective. We did work trying to tweak the thank you emails going out from Solution Reach to Manforce, but they didn't want to let us put customized links in there. They didn't want to allow us to bypass their own internal surveys, even though one, no one's going to fill out an entire Solution Reach survey and then leave a review on Google. They feel like they've done their part. So um that's why we developed the app uh and if anyone wants to you know you know for a further demonstration of how it works it really is a very very powerful tool uh, that we make available for our uh, marketing clients uh the next one i think is also for you if we can remo remove negative reviews should we okay um generally with the ex uh, generally you cannot remove negative reviews um google is pretty strict about that and uh you know Generally, what I counsel is if you have a few negative ones, um, just drown it in sunshine. That's why you have to be proactive. That's why you really have to focus on the other 99 patients who have a fantastic experience every time they're in there. Um, so uh, that's one thing. There are exceptions. If something is clearly a prank uh, intended for someone else, um, it's a double negative, meaning someone has, you know, uh, posted a negative review multiple times or from different accounts, but it's the same person. If it's in breach in any way, like those are, those examples are with the Google terms of service, you can trigger a phone call with a Google rep and ask them to look into it and remove it. Do a little bit of your background research uh, into who did the posting. If they have no other reviews on anywhere, that's a good thing you can point out that they, they may be bogus. Um, if it's you know I had a I had a uh, a client have someone post a review that was obviously bogus about how the doctor went ahead and made him blind, um, and it was clearly written by a drunk fourteen year old. Uh, he managed to get that reviewed by calling Google. Um, it won't always work, but you can. The good thing is if you call them, you'll get someone different every time. So you might get you know you, you might just have to do it a few times. Uh, I actually wrote a, a I have a. a I wrote a landing page on how to do that. You know, I'm happy to share some links uh, at the end if people would like about uh, removing negative reviews if possible. Um, it's negative reviews are generally not you're not able to remove them, uh, and it is an opportunity to address their concerns without addressing anything they said about them. You know, keep it general. Um, but in some ways, having some negativity seems more legitimate. If someone is 800 reviews and every single one is five star, you start to wonder if they're hiring a firm, you know, in the third world to, you know, leave reviews. Um, having some negative reviews makes you look more real. Um, but uh, when they get really downright, you know, libelous, then that's a time to look at the Google terms of service. 
Um, next one, um, I've, uh, so I've personalized it by saying thank you, i.e. The, the patient's name. Um, it's not that it's a HIPAA violation. It, I'm sorry. It, you're, when you're doing, my recommendation would be don't do that. Okay, because um, there's a there's a common theme. A lot of the questions that I'm seeing here are around um, how you respond. Should you use the patient's name? Um, in general, they posted it. Their name is on that, so you don't really need to do it. And my recommendation, and, and as much as I say this is not, I realize it's not, let's say, um, good to graces. Um, it's better to do be you know err on the side of conservatism. Um, than to be worrying about, you know, social graces, folks. So um, my recommendation would be, uh, since it's already posted in their name, there is no reason for you to say their name again. Um, so I would, I would let it go and not put the, the patient's name back into um, or, or what they put on their page. All right, see, the next one is, uh, how should you respond to a negative review, uh, but the patient's name is not recognized in your database? Ooh, that's kind of a combination of you and I. <laughs> yeah, you want to you wanna answer the... Uh... The name issue first. So the name issue, if you don't know who they are, uh, my response would be, um, you know, please contact the office. Thank you for your feedback. Contact the office. And I've actually have had client, many clients have this problem. Uh, the patient reviewed the wrong practice. Okay. So same thing over and over again here. You're going to need a comment. Be polite. Be courteous. Be anonymous. Thank you for this feedback. We value it. Here's a contact information to, for us to resolve this for you. Yeah, I don't know how you feel about it. Uh, I feel the same way. Um, if they brought up specific issues, you can talk about those issues in the abstract. Like if it was about how long they had to wait, you know, say something like, we strategize to minimize wait times as much as we can. However, things do happen. We'd like to resolve this. Reach out to us. Um, I used to advise, uh, I used to have clients who, you know, would be like, well, you know, you should state. Uh, that we have no record of you being a patient, but I have learned uh, in my work in this that that is a HIPAA problem, so I don't recommend that. Um, and um, yeah, I think we're, we're pretty much on the same page. So uh, the next two or three are ones that, that their insurance company told them not to respond. Um, you know, a couple of people have asked that if they know the patient that they can communicate with them privately. Um, yes to all, well, I'm sorry, no to the insurance company. Um, often insurance companies, you are dealing with somebody who may not truly be an expert in this arena. So it's not that they're, I'm not trying to beat them up here, but, but if this is not their area of domain expertise, I don't quote insurance policies, so they should stay away from compliance related things. I think it is, and, and as you've heard, you and I both say multiple times, it's good to respond. That's good. That, that's good business. Just don't get into personal or PHI related things. It, you know, PHI, by the way, a lot of people understand it is any identifying characteristic. It can be an IP address. It can be their first name, last name, initial. It can be a picture of their eyeball. Okay, guys, stay away from confirming or denying. Stick to what would be the, the you know, neutral things. Um, uh, so what is the name of the, uh, okay, let's see. Um, uh, if you recognize the patient by their name, can you communicate privately or pick up the phone without crossing the line? Yeah, they're your patient. Okay. Um, if you're, if you know that they're your patient and they've posted something, you don't want to call them. Um, you know, don't be creepy about it. Right. I mean, don't be like, Hey, I saw what you wrote about me, but if they wrote you something good or negative and you know that and you truly recognize the patient, that's just a different, that's a, that, that that's a good personalized way to communicate with them. V, do you have a, a strong feeling? Is there, would you prefer them to respond written over, over phone? Um, it's not a HIPAA issue. It's, Right. So uh, from a from a SEO perspective, the more interactions you have with people on your Google My Business listing, the better. And the more you have a chance to show others that you take patient concerns seriously. And that's why you keep it general, but you do respond to a negative review. Um, so I still think, you know, if it, if if you want them, if you want to try to resolve it, picking up the phone is something I recommend all the time to clients. Um, often they're not findable. It's not resolvable. And really it's important to keep in mind that you're not responding to the, to the, the sour great person who left the review. You're doing it for everyone else's benefit because that's your chance to, to show who you are as a practice again, without getting into any of the personal specifics. It's not your day in court. 
All right, so we are up on the hour. Um, I would say, as uh, you had some links that you wanted to share. Um, I'll, I'll explain what are the links in front of you folks. Um, one of the things we do is we have a free security and compliance checklist. If you go to our website or if you copy this link down in front of you or just Google free security and compliance checklist, you'll probably find us. Um, this is, a, by the way, this is not something you're giving to us. This is an actual document you print out. It's 10 questions. If you are feel you can answer those 10 questions confidently, then you're in good shape. If you have, you know, you're not feeling so good about it, um, our pleasure uh, as the endorsed solution for the AOA, um, we, 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 we are here to answer questions for optometrists and their staff. Uh, we even have an ask the auditor uh, function on the AOA website that you can just post us a question. You do not need to be a client uh, and it will be our pleasure to, um, uh, to share. Uh, so uh, you may notice, um, on your chat box on the right, uh, V shared a, a link uh, to his ebook. So, so there's some great information on there. Um, so, so please, uh, folks, before uh, before you jump off, make sure you grab those. Um, all right. And if there aren't any other, um, uh, for folks, a couple of the questions came in. We we will definitely uh, follow up. There's going to be a a, quest, a survey actually at the end of this webinar. Uh, if you would like more information from either Compliance Group or Eye Care Pro. Please feel free. Uh, by the way, even if it's just questions, we will glad. We are both, um, you know, you know, here here to, um, uh, you know, help support the industry. Is there any closing remarks you want to put up there? Um, no. Uh, make sure to. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> always, uh, always make uh, reviews part of your your in house strategy for for growth. Um, it's really one of the most important things you're doing. Even if you're doing nothing else, it's it, it's a significant piece of the pie um, to bring in more new, you know, new patients. And that um, I, I see there were a few questions about that app. It's part of a family of apps we've developed for our clients called Get Set Pro. Um, and if anyone would like a demonstration, please, please uh, reach out to me and I'd love to show you uh, what it can do. It can uh, upload, uh, you can also update, you know, your frame lines, set up campaigns, update your insurances, make minor changes to the website, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, the review piece is, uh, is, is something we've been actually we developed initially as its own app uh, and then that included in this family because reviews are really, really important. We want to make them as easy as possible to generate for, uh, for our clients. Good. All right, everybody, we greatly appreciate you spending time with us. I hope you found it valuable. Uh, um, like I said, this is an ongoing series. We do uh, at least one of these a month and then we look forward to doing more with our care pro. Um, Z, thank you so much for, for jumping in on our, uh, on our uh, free education series, and we hope you will all join us in the future. Everybody, thank you. Have a great day.